Mike Krieger. I'm CTO and co-founder of Instagram. Um, and today I'm going to talk about how we use machine learning um, and editorial curation together to build really cool products. But I'm going to start first with a story. And it's not Thursday. I'll also do a throwback Thursday. So I'll start with a throwback Tuesday. Um, and we're going to go all the way back to 1908. And that was when they opened the public branch, uh, the big main branch of the New York Public Library. Um, and here's a photo of it, or maybe an illustration of it from way back when. And really, really quickly accumulated a lot of books. Um, and they realized really quickly by 1915, so just seven years in, 100 years ago, it's hard to think about that, that they were getting all these requests from people who'd come in and say, well, do you have a picture of this? Do you have a picture of that? Ph photographs were starting to become more and more of a thing, or even illustrations. Unfortunately, they didn't have Google, so they just couldn't tell people to go Google it. Um, and instead, they formed something called the Picture Collection, uh, which looks like this today. It's pretty beautiful. And they accumulated 17,991 pictures in the first year. Think about that, 1915, they're starting to catalog things. Um, and nowadays, that collection is 1.2 million pictures and photographs across 12,000 different categories. Not hashtags, but things like handshakes and financial panics and beards and mustaches and hair combing. Um, uh, the artist Taryn Simon did a wonderful project where she actually did big, large-scale photographs of some of these folders that they're in. This is handshake. Um, but I, was, I came across this, and I was looking at that, and I said, oh, there's 1.2 million photographs accumulated over 100 years. During this talk, we're going to get over 1.2 million photographs uploaded onto Instagram. Nowadays, 75% of photos are taken on some sort of camera phone, and the New York Times estimates there's going to be 1 trillion taken in 2015. I don't know how they estimate that, but it's a really big number. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to talk about how we've started making sense of all that data. We get 80 million of them every single day. When we talk about Instagram, we like to talk, us, talk about ourselves as capturing and sharing the world's moments. That's our mission statement. It's what we talk about internally. And really, it's about connecting people who are using Instagram to the world as it, it's happening. On a global scale, so 75% of our users are global, we want it to be timely, not about last weekend, last month, last year, or the 1900s. It's about right now. And we want it to be personal. We give you a lot of control over who you follow, about uh, what's in your feed, et cetera and doing so at scale. We've just crossed 400 million users as we celebrated our fifth birthday. So you can imagine there's a lot of fun stuff. At first, I thought, oh, this is going to be easy. We're just going to like, apply some machine learning, big data, hand-wavy stuff. Um, fortunately, that's not how it works. <laughs> uh, it, instead, this is more of the talk about how we've gone through a whole process from starting very editorial, evolving, and where we are today. So I'll first talk about some of the first approaches we had. You might remember if you were on the, on the product early on how we evolved those algorithms in our, in our second, third, and fourth year, and how recently I think we've started finding a really nice balance between pure editorial, pure machine learn, there's something in between. So let's rewind now back to 2010. Um, we had the suggested users product, which is basically editorial v1 for us. Our first hire, instead of being an engineer or a designer or an ops person, all of whom would have been really necessary at the time, was a community manager. His name was Josh. Um, we realized really quickly that the way we were going to succeed wasn't just building better technology or better products. It was about having a really active, engaged community. Um, so he would get in touch with people, find out what was working for them, what wasn't working, um, and curated a lot of really great content on our blog, which we started immediately after hiring him. We'd do things like year in photos. Um, we'd highlight interesting accounts from around the world. And we found that the blog was great for telling people uh, about Instagram who were already on Instagram, but what about the newcomers? especially for one question, which is who they're going to follow. We find that who you follow, and if you follow the right set of folks, is the biggest determinant of whether you're going to churn or not after two or three weeks. So it's really important that you get that right on the first day. And we had some options, like you could follow your Facebook friends who had joined Instagram at the time, or you could look at who you follow on Twitter. Um, but some people just choose to skip that because they didn't want to do either. So we ended up building this suggested user product, um, and it was totally hand-picked, infrequently rotated because we had a lot of other stuff going on. Sometimes timely. We did an Olympics one once, but it wasn't something that we were regularly updating. And we found ourselves in the uncomfortable position of being these queen and king makers, where we were basically anointing this group of like 20 to 25 accounts as suggested. They'd blow up like crazy for the first few weeks, um, and then they would be really upset if we took them off. And it wasn't personalized at all. So I got the same list as somebody down the street. We changed it slightly country by country, but that wasn't really enough. So you might ask, like, was this effective? Did it help reduce churn? And nope. So uh, you were equally likely to churn if you followed one of our suggested users as if you had not followed any at all. So here we are, 2013. 
our user discovery product is totally hand curated and not super effective. But was there other sort of interesting discovery stuff going on, on the platform? Well, for that, we had the popular page. If you used the product back then, you'll remember the popular page. And it was really meant to be a useful first time experience and sort of set the tone for what Instagram was to people. I mean, you're coming in for the first time, you haven't heard of Instagram before, what do you see? And this is what you saw early on. It was pretty nice. You know, it was people exploring the world, showing that for the first time that really you could capture interesting moments on a camera phone um, and share them with the world. People got, you know, pretty excited about that. We did, in Instagram, we like to talk about doing the simple thing first. It's our, basically our mantra internally. Um, and this is what we did for the popular page. Simple thing first was the most liked photos on Instagram decayed over time. So I'm just going to show the code that does this, which is funny because over the first few years, like what the popular page and how it was calculated was the subject of a lot of like anguish in uh, uh, our community, but there's our code. Um, so basically it's really simple. It was just the number of likes over the number of followers you have. So we're normalizing for the number of followers um, and decayed over a few um, different hours. And there's a constant in there for the people you're following to make sure you're not like, you don't have a thousand followers because you followed 5,000 people kind of thing. So. That worked pretty well, but the problem was as we evolved, the median user, which is basically what this is optimizing for, started changing and drifting. And we ended up in this situation where people were writing articles like what the Instagram popular page has become. Um, and it, this is what it had become. It was like mirror selfies and makeup and celebrities. And some people really love that. And then some people are not interested in that at all. And we'd get all this love on Twitter like this one. Um, we got a lot of Twitter hate. Um, and. Um, uh, and we basically had now an editorial suggested user product that wasn't working very well and an ex a popular page that basically had worked great for our first six months and as we'd grown past 10, 20, 30 million users, it just stopped being that effective. So we took stock of that and he said, all right, how can we evolve our algorithms? In other words, how can we make explore not suck? We renamed it the explore page as well. So we did the simple thing first got us started, it was clearly not working anymore. Um, so what was like the next simplest thing that we could do? So we decided to run a few A-B tests. And we did things like, let's suggest photos that are popular, same algorithm, but scoped to just your country. It's an interesting idea. Photos that were liked by those users that we were suggesting in that other step. It's like combining bad with bad and hoping good comes out of that. Um, or images that we curated ourselves. So take the blog content and put it in our popular page. And we found all of that was about a 10% improvement which is not very exciting. Um, and so we were like, this is not quite right. And then one of, one of the days, one of our engineers, Thomas, decided to try, uh, why don't we take the photos liked by the people you follow? So it's a very complex graph here. Let's say I'm user A, I follow user B. They go off on Instagram on one of these like, you know, liking sprees and they like these two photos. We got about five first, five X increase in engagement almost overnight from making that change, which is pretty exciting. Um, but change is hard if you've ever built product and released it to the world and then changed it. You know that people love nothing more than complaining about things that have changed. Uh, so we got new tweets that now we're like, Every it sucks and everyone hates the new version, just leave it how it was. Which was like a good like insight for me, which is like sometimes you have a very small group of users that's still using a feature that's not working, but they do love it for a reason. But we were trying to dig into it, is it just change a version, are people just upset because it's new? Um, but then we, we found a, a few tweets like this that I think were really informative. So. If you don't know what basics are, you can urban dictionary it. Um, and basically we're like, ah, oh, what's going on? And we realized not every follow is created equal. So we were suggesting photos liked by people you follow, but some of the people you follow, you follow because they take amazing photographs, you're interested in what they're doing, and some are like your fellow high schoolers, right, that you're following more for a social reason. So take two was a pretty evolutionary step on that, which is photos liked by people whose photos you've liked. So. If I like this photo, like this nice photo of a lake, um, and it was taken by B, this other user, and they like that, um, uh, then we'll suggest that. So this was actually 7x better than our baseline, um, which we got pretty excited about. And then from then on with Explore, and we've kept iterating and making further improvements, looking at everything from how long people are dwelling on each image, um, who the other followers are, um, what country they're in, and these signals now make up about 90 different features um, that our machine learning system, which we built on top of Facebook's machine learning platform, um, can analyze and it's cool because it means that the system is continuously improving itself as it learns what works and doesn't work and this area has basically no human curation. So are we done? Are we like totally set? Is this going to work for every part of our app? Well we found that this was a really good fit for Explore because Explore is this experience where you're just sitting back, infinite grid, just scrolling, you're just relaxing. It doesn't really matter if one or two recommendations are kind of iffy and you don't need a lot of context about why an image is there. You're like, ah, it's just Explore. It's one of 20 photos. I like this one the best. 
So we found it had limitations, and there were things that we wanted to build more recently in the last year, where we realized just this pure machine learning approach wasn't going to work. Basically, we wanted to organize people into categories and help tell stories about different events. So I'll jump into how, more recently, we've actually combined those two different threads, the curation that had some early promise but proved to be pretty limited, and this machine learning that was working really well for Explore. So the project we had to do was cluster users. And it started from the, the point where we wanted to evolve our suggested users product. So now we would take your Facebook followers, your Twitter friends, the other friends of friends in your network, and we were able to build a suggested user product in the last couple years that was really good. It was similar to Explore. Um, we used machine uh, learning to rank the different options about who to follow. And this was both for new and existing folks. Um, and it was really effective. It was far more effective than our previous uh, system. We took in everything from your favorite accounts, who you follow, your age and gender, all these different hundreds of features into machine learning. But it turns out, for new users who were just signing up, who we knew basically nothing about because they didn't follow anybody, we were actually giving them that same old suggested user list back from 2010, with some slightly new users, but not really any evolution in how those uh, users were chosen. So we thought about what if we could offer categories. Some people are going to be interested in NBA stars and football stars. Other people might be interested in uh, knitting. Like, how can we actually give them an experience where they can opt into a few different categories? And we wanted to build a system that could categorize these people, but that was actually complete and scalable. We didn't want to just be a few editors sitting in the room going like, oh, yeah, I've heard of that account. I'm going to write that one down, or just having some really simple way of doing it. So we prototyped the manual list approach, and we found that not only was it limited, it was a lot of work to generate good candidates for all these different categories we wanted to do. Because eventually, we'd like to get as down uh, sort of as detailed as we could. So for example, it's not just sports. It's not just wrestling. It might be jujitsu and like subcategories of that. And one of the days, one of the one of the days we were working on this, an engineer came up with the idea, which is, well, in Instagram users have biographies, and they often will list what they're interested in biographies. Can we use that um, as a content source? So we started looking at follower biographies to see if they would be helpful. So imagine user A says, "I love fashion and basketball." User B is a fashion addict, fashion emoji, um, and user C hearts basketball, basketball emoji, um, and you have these three folks. And imagine you know A and B follow Vogue. And A and C follow Stephen Curry from the Golden State Warriors. Um, well, this is a very simplified example, but we can start using that to infer that Vogue is probably about fashion, and Stephen Curry probably belongs under basketball. And we can run that across all 400 million of our users and actually start bucketing and categorizing them and propagate that down to every single user. But we realized, like, while this was like a cool technology, it really needed that human touch to actually uh, bring it home and make the product sing. So we have a group of editors that take a lot of that massive data, look at our top categories that kind of got inferred by the system, vet the categories, name them, right? Because what might be in the bio might not actually represent what a human would want to receive the category as, and filter for, do these things belong? Is this person really a basketball player? Is there anybody missing? Like, oh, for some weird reason, LeBron James didn't get included. Let's make sure he's in there. Um, and also break apart categories that, because of the k-means clustering, to get nerdy for a second, got stuck together, but actually are different. So for example, trucks and beer should not be the same category. We want to break those two apart. Um, and the product looks like this. And so every new person that joins Instagram uh, makes it through here and can opt into any number, any number of these categories. It's been a really helpful way uh, for people who are just getting started, who we don't know anything about, to still have a great experience where we're not just suggesting randomly. Uh, instead, we're, we're kind of combining the, the best of being able to find the great accounts and then properly name and edit and filter them. The other area where we're really working together between humans and, and machine learning uh, is storytelling and live event curation. So this is really hot off the presses. Um, we just did the first launch for this a couple days ago. Unfortunately, US only because it was Halloween, um, but I'll talk a little bit about it. So four of our biggest days in the US for Instagram are Halloween, New Year's, Valentine's, and Thanksgiving. You can imagine why. They're pretty photo-friendly moments. Um, and Halloween, especially, I love, because you get to see outfits and craziness from basically all around the country. Um, and we wanted to build something that showed you Halloween as it was happening. Not, again, I talked about global and timely. This is not as global as just US, so national and timely. But we wanted to give you something that it wasn't like, oh, three days later, yeah, Halloween was great. I wanted something that you could check multiple times. Bring it to life. And we wanted to focus on videos as a really interesting way of doing that. Because you can really see how people were getting ready, different trick-or-treating, things like that. And we want it to be ongoing and rapidly updating, not just one big pass at the end of the day. So what we did is we took the machine learning pipeline that we had trained on Explore to suggest what might be good photos related to Halloween. Either they were tagged with a particular Halloween hashtag, or we had some other indication of that, to surface all these candidates. So we're taking millions of Halloween photos, 
servicing down thousands, and then we have live curators take that, and they're able to apply a bunch of live queries to it, say like, oh, show me photos that have been recently liked um, in this hashtag or in this country or in this place. So pretty rich query tools that they can use in the moment, but they're not filtering over the entire million set. They're filtering over something we've pre-selected. And given them this is a simple thing first, which is why it's really ugly and basic, built in like a couple of days, but give them some really easy tools so they could publish to this live story. Um, and it was neat. We ended up creating an experience that looked a little bit like this. So this is an illustrator who uh, almost always does these cool Halloween ones. And then some really undiscovered stuff, like this random dancing panda bear. We never would have found that without some of these great tools. Um, but what was fun about this, it took a lot of the best of our ML work, and it didn't just happen for the surfacing of content, but even while they were working on the video, what they were or on this video story, what they would see is, oh, look, this video has the best video playthrough rate. It's getting the most watches. Let's make sure it's at the top. This one is not working so well. Let's downrank it. So while there was this heavy editorial hand in there, we were also using a lot of smarts from what people were doing in real time and really able to tell a curated story, which we're excited to do for a lot more events and do more globally in the future. So when I look forward and look back, um, this has really been the story of us adapting and evolving to a community that started with 25,000 people on the first day, a million people in the first three months, a couple hundred thousand photos a day to now 80 million, adapting it to international scale, setting us up so that we can bring as many of these products internationally as possible and not have a human curator for every single country and every single place. Um, apply the best of our machine learning technology, which again, we get to build on top of things like Facebook's platform. Um, but with the craft and curation that I think of as really strong to Instagram and really central to Instagram's brand, whether that's exploring infinite grids where you're really uh, letting yourself do some of the curation yourself and liking and following different accounts, um, to the editorial touch we were able to bring to our suggested users and build categories that are human readable and make sense. Um, and finally, the storytelling uh, experience that we just launched, and I'm looking forward to bringing uh, to a lot more events going forward. But really, it really feels like we're just getting started. I think overall as an industry, we're going through this interesting moment of humans versus machines, and hopefully this paints an interesting picture of how we're trying to find ways of blending them together. Thank you very much.